Your Creative Push, episode 38. There are no mistakes, and, and take the mistake and turn it into something beautiful, a future. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Young Min Brown, and my guest today is Kent Gustafson. You might know Kent as an award-winning author for his biography on musician Doc Watson called Blind But Now I See, or you might know him as a musician and producer with 14 critically acclaimed albums, or you might know him as a teacher, as a student at Stony Brook University if you happen to go there in New York, or maybe you know him as a public speaker and perhaps you've already been inspired by him from his TED Talk, which, by the way, you absolutely have to watch if you haven't. Kent, you're known for doing a lot of things, as we can see, but how do you know yourself, first and foremost? Well, I don't do too much to get to know myself. Uh, (laughs) So the question, how do I know myself? Uh, I mean, that's a hard question to answer. I I think when I was in college, I I kind of went on a hunt for myself. I kind of had that that obsession for a while. And I didn't have much luck. Uh, and I did a whole lot of hiking and a whole lot of traveling and, and around the world and everything else. And I think it's been a, a real progress. But but 15 years ago in a month, um, what I talk about in my TED Talk, you know, the, this um, near fatal car wreck with my dad. I mean, anybody who's been through a trauma like that, um, you kind of have a turnaround and and reexamine really everything. And, and from that moment on, it's it's just been clear to me that you know, I should do what, what I love doing. And, and it's, it's been clear to the people around me that that's uh, the best thing to do too. Absolutely. Um, and can you take us back to maybe one of the first moments of creativity? What I like is, um, uh, how art teachers see the world. So graphic art teachers, um, kind of like, um, where the little grain of sand in the, in the, in the oyster turns into a pearl. Um, the, my, uh, art teacher, um, Uh, Connie Helke, I think it was, Um, uh, she taught us that there were no mistakes. Um, It's it's a pretty remarkable thing to hear from any teacher. And it's something that I I wrapped into myself um, at that point. And it it was like, you know, if you're you're drawing a face of somebody and you, you accidentally, you know, mess up a line or something, well, make it a feature. And actually, you know, writing the biography on Doc Watson, um, you know, mu- great musicians, uh, particularly jazz and Im- Im- improvise uh, kind of mus- musicians, if they make a mistake, it actually turns into the feature. If you really listen to the greats, um, they'll throw a funny note in there and you think, was that a mistake? But then what they do with it, uh, it actually becomes a feature and it, and it, it, you'll hear the whole audience kind of sigh and be like, wow, that was awesome. So, so that one moment for me of like, there are no mistakes and, and take the mistake and turn it into something uh, beautiful, a future. I think that's like kind of a scary thing to do for, for some people, like especially perfectionists. What would you suggest to people who have a tough time to kind of embrace the mistake as you're talking about? Well, I think what, what's interesting, so I'm actually a perfectionist also. So for me, it, it has become my way of making something perfect. Um if you walk down the street and the, the road is full of uh, black ice uh, that you can't see, um, as long as you slide your feet, you're not going to wipe out. Um, you know, if you're anticipating failure, when you fail, it's like, man, oh, cool, I failed. Um, what am I going to learn from that? Striving for perfection has to have failure in it. I think that was, you know, a mistake I made early on a couple of times or many times but you have to, you can't live on top of Everest. You, you, you climb up the mountain, you hang out there for like minutes or however long those guys <laughs> yeah. are up there, and then you come back down. You know, you, you can't live up there. So it's, that's, you know, perfection is hitting the top of Everest, but you can't live in perfection. Yeah, I love that idea. And hopefully, <laughs> if you are actually climbing Everest, you don't make too many mistakes, though. I think it's good to be exactly that. That's a good point. <laughs> Well, and, and I'm sure, and, and you know, from what I've heard in, in mountain climbing and so forth, it's something is going to come your way that's crazy. Something's going to happen where something breaks, something, and you have to have that 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 plan of like, um, you know, improvising, you know, getting out of, uh, you know, getting over that. And and you know, all great 
startups and entrepreneurs face those those problems and when they fix the problem that actually becomes the great product right yeah absolutely i I love that advice um speaking of what are some things that kind of come up in your creativity whether it's in in music or writing or whatever it may be um that kind of maybe holds you back on a daily basis the the thing for me is taking care of myself so i i don't have blocks the same way that most people do i i don't sit in front of the computer saying oh woe is me i I can't come up with the next uh thing you know i can actually turn on like a lot of us i've trained my ability to be able to turn creativity on um but the difficult thing for me is to 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 also be mindful you know to uh (laughs) Whether it's the Pomodoro method or it's the, you know, some kind of app or if it's meditation or whatever it is, for me, it's just literally, can I, you know, remember to not sit for five straight hours staring at a computer screen or, right. or uh, you know, if it's music, you know, I used to, you know, sit down and play for five straight hours and then not be able to move for, you know, <laughs> for a day. Um, yeah, yeah, or, or a couple of you know studio recording experiences where you know you just it's a twelve-hour marathon or something, and, and you can go through some of that. But uh, I think focusing on yourself and and your own health is important. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, a lot of people don't, it, myself included, <laughs> um, like going to the gym or whatever is a uh, is a tough thing to to kind of consider doing <laughs> exactly with when I have so much, so much else on my plate, but then after you're done, you're just completely a different person and it kind of affects all assets of your life. So, yeah. And the, the, what we forget is, 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 um, basic physiology and psychology and all that good stuff where, you know, if you want to be the greatest, um, uh, athlete, you have to take days off. Like if you want to be the greatest musician, you got to take days off. Like it's, it's, it's amazing how our brains work, but we can train those muscles, but we can't, you know, we, we, we're breaking them down, but then we have to let them heal and build up again and they'll build up stronger. But, um, it's the same thing with creativity. If I could be on, 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 um, but my creativity is going to suffer a little bit and mostly I'm going to (laughs) suffer. Yeah. And just for, after creation, like it's, it's nice to sometimes spend a little bit of time on the top of the mountain as you're, as you're saying, um, to kind of enjoy it. You got to at least, well, you got to at least do a selfie, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> maybe, maybe put a flag in there. Or yeah. Yeah. Call your wife from the top, you know? Yeah. By the way, Everest, don't, don't watch it. The move, the recent movie that came out. So depressing. <laughs> yeah. It's brutal. Exploration is, is is fascinating um but the, the life and death death risk of climbing everest it's not that far off from the life and death risk of sitting in front of a computer screen uh that's the the, the funny thing about it you know um there there's so many risks that we take with our health um uh every day uh and and you know I, heck we're talking about health the whole time but it it really is key um, cause you asked about my weakness. That's my weakness. That's my Everest. So I've read that you've coached hundreds of authors to finish books. Um, can you tell me about that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of started as, you know, as this little tyke, um, with a poet for a mom and, you know, she would come to my elementary school classes, which actually I was kind of a geek. So I, I dug it, you know, I thought my mom was the the best, you know, and she'd come to my little elementary school class and we do all kinds of poems and and it was great. But, you know, quickly from that very young age, um, I was obsessed with art. I was obsessed with writing, loved, you know, um, music and all kinds of things. But um, from a very early age, I was almost like critiquing her. Stuff. I was reading it. She was showing me other stuff. And I was re- it was like um, really just studying with a master. And I didn't realize much later, how much of a master writer she was, uh, or, or still is, right, and and um, and continues to be, um, and that that was really formative for me. After I was a little kid, you know, I, I grew up. I, I started studying science. I I, I kind of connected the hemispheres of my brain and was really into linear stuff and mathematics and all that. 
um, until, you know, during college, I sort of realized that I could go into the creative side of things and, and started to explore that. Um, the coaching of authors happened because it just was natural. I, I, I started a, a, a music publishing company first, um, you know, just very haphazardly, just, just trying things out, um, kind of hacking. Um, and I, I, I went to my parents' house and, and there were, you know, 20 manuscripts just sitting in the closet. My mom was a published poet and, and everything else, but, but, um, there were all these amazing manuscripts that just were sitting there. And I thought, well, why, why don't we get them out? Um, and so my company, Blooming Twig, my, my publishing company is, is named for my mom. So her maiden name is Blomquist, a Swedish name, which loosely translates like to Blooming Twig. Um, and so I, I started that about 11, 11 years ago and um, very quickly figured out that the, the quickest way I could help people was by coaching them. Uh, you know, I mean, I could I could do it for somebody, but I was a teacher. I was a you know, I was a graduate student. I was starting to be a professor and I knew how to teach people. And this, it just it was the connection of education and, and writing. And, and ever, ever since then, I, I still do a lot of coaching and advising, and I, I still love it, whether it's a startup or a, a brand or a or an author. What would you say is, like, the number one thing that, like, in your experience, holds people back from finishing a, a book or finishing whatever they're, they're started? Well, so, so I see authors um, now like I see speakers, like I see entrepreneurs, like I see musicians um, and all these creative people, even a little bit like I see, you know, uh, uh, surgeons, people who are literally reconstructing a human body, you know, um, people in the creative life. It, it's this concept, again, of being able to turn on and turn off your creativity. So oftentimes, if you're given an assignment that that says, uh, write an article about this guy. That that's not too bad. I mean, you, you have an interview, you you polish it up, you 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 take care of it. But if someone says, make a groundbreaking record, um, write the next great novel, or if you put your un yourself under that pressure, even if it's a business book, I want to write a book as as well as uh, Seth Godin. <laughs> you know, I, I I hold myself to the highest standard. I want to be that simple, and that just awesome, right? That when you hold yourself to those kind of standards, I think those are the real blocks. Um, and so I, I actually one of one of the things I always do to just get a chuckle, but also to to really get people started is I talk about puke and polish. Puke um, and polish. You got to get it out right, and and it doesn't have to look pretty, you know. Mm. And uh, the polish can come later on. Yeah, I like that. That's just like. It's gross. <laughs> when you have to, when, <laughs> well, no, but when you have to puke, you know, it feels so much better once you get it out. That's right. Yeah. Well, and and, and um, that that's that's actually you know the interesting thing about it is a lot of it, it's true. The block itself is having to get this thing out of you. Yeah, it's, and it makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Um, what would you say is like your your number one thing that you say to potential authors to to get them to finish the the thing about authors is they come in many different varieties so the book itself is a very low cost uh, transactional item um, that that a lot of us value at you know a buck because we can go to the local used bookstore or even these awesome little you know sprout up libraries everywhere and get a book for free or for a dollar or a couple dollars mm -hmm. Um, maximum 20 bucks, right? So this is not an expensive item. However, the books that we love, the books that have changed our lives have a spot right next to our bed or right behind us in our office, um, or we give them as gifts to each other. So it's, it's, it's at the same time, the highest value and the lowest value, but for the author themselves, where are they getting the money? And I think that's the real key to the answer to that question. So if an author simply simply needs to get something out if it's a if it's a memoir and it's 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 a it's important to their family and it's important to the world um then there's a different advice than for a businessman who really needs to get better speaking gigs and needs to have a, a credentializer you know um and so i think i think an author is not really an author and i think actually every single book person should write a book mm -hmm. 
because uh, why not? We're in a totally new era where like, if you write 10 pages on something awesome, make it into a book, <laughs> you know? Right. So, so that it reframes your question, but, um, doesn't quite answer it. I think I'm, I'm circling your point. What was the question again? <laughs> um, like the number one thing that you would, um, advice that you would give to potential authors oh, don't, to get them to finish. Yeah. So to get them, so, so to get them to finish is to, to have your audience in mind, I think. So, uh, who exactly is this for? And I think not, not pie in the sky. Like I want to sell a million copies. Well, to, to whom, right? Like right, to, right. to, 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 you know, very specifically, who's the person going to be reading this book? And I always talk about, um, you know, um, demographics show that men read books, guess what, on the john, right? So <laughs> I've been, for for three minutes a day, 10 minutes, I don't know, that, that's up to you in your bathroom, right? But for, <laughs> if you get that 20 minutes of freedom to like read your book in the morning in the bathroom, yeah. that's like, that's man time. And I'm not being sexist here. This is real, like these, this real research. So if you're writing a book for men, um, are you going to write it in pieces that are, you know, three minutes long where he's not touching his cell phone? Cause that'd be nasty. <laughs> he is, well, maybe he probably is, but, um, it's, it's that three minute block of time where he's going to devote his attention to those two pages or whatever it might be. So is he going to dog ear your content? Is he going to come back to your book again and again? Um, and then he might bring it from the bathroom into the boardroom. Hey, that was a cool line. I've never said that before, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> then you're in the position of honor, like right there on his desk, you know? Right. Uh, but, but women, for example, where do they read? Um, it, again, stereotypically it's in bed or in a comfortable chair or, um, and it's in a far more narrative fashion. So it's not like a, a, a tiny little chunks of time. It tends to be um, uh, 10 pages or something. Maybe it's before the person goes to bed. Maybe it's when they're relaxing. Anyway, so, so there's demographic data that, that really shows differences between people. And if you say architects between the ages of 30 and 45 that happen to be female, okay, well, you can drill down and tell me, you know, look through that two-way mirror, you know, like the guy, like the murderer who's like tapping on the the mirror saying, I can see you, even though he can't, it's the, <laughs> it's easy for the reader to see the author, but, but your goal as an author is to see the reader. So that's a long answer, but a short, short real answer, which is to see your reader. Yeah. I think that's really good advice. And I think it kind of goes to really any creative pursuit where um, other people are going to see it. Um, I'd narrow it down even further for podcasting. Um, I was taught to pick what, what they call an avatar. And it's that one person that you're kind of writing to, you know, write their whole story out, you know, so you know, like who they are and when they're going to be listening. So my avatar is me. Um, it's a guy with a full time job that listens like on his ride home it makes it a much more like personal experience when you can do that. And it makes it much easier because when you have this like broad thing where like, I want the, everybody to be able to like appreciate this. Well, then you start thinking about everybody and it's, it's really hard to kind of write from your heart and write exactly what you want to write for that specific person that you really want to read it. Yeah. Well, and, and, and in that case, I mean, I love using avatars and the concept of an avatar. It's it's brilliant and actually make people go to the point of like naming their avatar, saying what they look like. Are they overweight? You know, I mean, does their does their wife like them? Does their husband like them? You know, all that stuff. Like, do they have yeah. a dog? Right. Um, but but any but but to your point, um, think about the the show Car Talk. You know, uh, mm -hmm. where it's like it's one of my favorite shows that's ever been recorded. And I couldn't care less about cars, really. Like, I'm, I'm a guy, a guy's guy, but I don't, I'm not really a car guy, you know. And yet, I could listen to that show forever. It's hilarious. Right. Um, and the thing is, they aimed for a demographic. And then they were able to expand that out to the whole world, essentially, because it was so awesome in that demographic. And th there's another example in books of, like, Marley and Me uh, was... <laughs> You know, it, it, it's shot up in its own little category of like um, dog books. And it, and it might have even been niched down to like, um, you know, re Labrador Retriever books or something like that. So everybody else has like got the dummies guide to, you know, dogs. And, and the next book is like training your using the German something method. And then there's this book, Marley and Me. 
of course they're going to pick it up, you know, and they pick it up and they read it and say, this is great. And then, so it, it shot up in its own little category and then it was able to really climb the charts, um, from there. Yeah. It's a niche or niche until it hurts. I've heard that advice. I like that. Yeah. Really narrow down until you're like the expert in that field. And then from there you can, you know, expand once you have like a, a kind of a following. <laughs> and what I like is, I mean, you, you're, you're very quickly going to what, I mean, for the two of us, it seems natural, but not many people see this. Like I, I have a PhD in classical composition. Um, but what I, you know, I've started saying is I have a PhD in creativity because right. it's like, well, I, I don't, I'm a classical composer, but you don't see me spending four months writing a piece of classical music anymore. Um, I'm a book publisher. I'm a consultant. I'm a startup advisor. Like I, I do these other things, you know, but, but it opened up my mind to become a classical composer. And so once it's almost like once the, the switch is triggered, um, you know, we're, we're stuck. <laughs> we yeah. Got, we got to live this creative life, but I like how you're immediately drawing these connections between these creative pursuits. Cause a startup and a surgeon and a, and a musician and an author, they're all the same. And that's like, my dad is a doctor. That's why I keep bringing up uh, medicine because medicine is a creative art, you know, or it can be, let's say it's not always. <laughs> it can be, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who has like a lot of different kind of creative ideas, um, but hasn't really embarked in a single one of them? Would you advise them to kind of dip their toes in, in everything or kind of just pick one and, and go for that? Uh, so the, the interesting thing about this is um, I had a buddy in graduate school who bought me an egg timer and he said, all right, Ken, you got to, you know, every day wake up, set the egg timer to 30 minutes and freaking compose for 30 minutes. And I tried it. Like, I was like, okay, you know, I mean, there's there's great poets, great musicians that do this. They wake up every morning, and that's their time, and they compose. I did it, but it, it, I didn't create anything good, and it just didn't it didn't do anything for me. And I, I stopped because I thought it was ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. But then I thought, well, why am I this outlier? And so I talked to one of my great teachers, and she said to me, oh, no, I, I do like, you know, 72 hours at a time, and then I won't create for like weeks. <laughs> And I, th wow. I thought, okay. And then she's like, a oh, big yeah. egg timer for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Huge egg timer. And yeah, she had one. It was, it was the size of a wall. No, but, <laughs> but, um, but, but she, she, that really inspired me to say there are people like me out there, uh, who just have bursts of, of, um, creativity. And now, like I said, I can turn it on, but that's a trained thing The the best thing I can do is sit down for, uh, you lock me in a room for 18 hours, I'll come out with something crazy, you know? Um, but, but it's different for every person. You have to honor that in yourself. That's, that, that would be kind of my answer. Like if it's a little piece at a time, at a time of everything, cool. Why not? You know, as long as it's not your living. Um, cause if, 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 if that's where you're making your money and you've got a bunch of you know, incomplete projects, that's not so good. Right. Um, but if, if you enjoy like the buzz it gives you to have a bunch of open projects, I have, I have 15 books open on my nightstand. I'm not like the one book guy. Like I, Me too. <laughs> I can't, yeah, I can't take it. I'm like, I, nah, I, just, I don't want to read that one tonight, you know? Right. Um, and I might not even finish half of them, but then Same. <laughs> other people are like, oh, I got one book and I got to finish it, start to finish. Those are both creative people. It's just, you know, we all work differently. Yeah. And I think. Um, as you said, you're kind of a perfectionist and I, I feel like I am too, but there's certain things like, like reading books <laughs> where, like you said, it's whatever you're kind of in the mood for. I think the important thing to remember is just make sure you're enjoying it. Um, and it's not like this like stressful thing. Cause I used to stress out about it. I'd be like, think about all the books that I'm like in the middle <laughs> of. And then I wouldn't enjoy actually reading because it was like this task, you know, it's like, oh, I got to finish this so I can enjoy something else. So I think it's like really important to try to remember why you're doing it. And it should be, you know, if you're doing it for pleasure, then make sure you're having pleasure while you do it. Um, do you have a, like a great inspiration, um, like whether it be a person or like a thing that you draw inspiration from? I draw inspiration from almost everything now. I mean, I think, I, I, I think I was, I was blessed like a lot of creatives with, with having a lot of ups and downs. 
it's it's really hard sometimes because I do hit depths or I get really anxious or there's all kinds of stuff that happens and 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 um but I also when I look up at the sky and it's a blue sky, I really enjoy it. You know, I if I look at my dog, I mean I, I'm gonna like lay down on the ground next to her and just like be a dog for a minute. Like I I I truly enjoy uh what I see around me. So it's it's not a it's not a thing. Uh, well, I guess the, the fact that our, you know, this bag of bones functions and, and can enjoy the world around it, I guess that's what I draw inspiration from. Yeah, I think a lot of people forget not to just exist, but to kind of like live. I, I I definitely do that with my dogs, too. I try to like, <laughs> <laughs> I try to like be one with them and try to figure out what the hell they're thinking. <laughs> yeah, and, and dogs. Yeah, I mean, I, I love cats, too. Right. But dogs, right. there's a simplicity to them you know and i i love it for sure all right thank you so much kent for coming on the show today and for giving us that push yeah this was fun and you can find kent at dr kent.co that's d-r-k-e-n-t dot c-o um or you could also check out his website kent dot com kent thank you so much again for coming on the show and giving us that push awesome a huge thank you to kent for coming on the show a lot of great things in this episode, but I really, really love that idea of puke and polish. You know, it's just about puking it out, getting it out there. You'll feel so much better after you've puked it out there. And, uh, you know, who cares that it looks like puke? You know, you can, once it's out there in the universe, you can spend the time to fix it. And if that takes, you know, another session of puking it out and polishing it and puking it out and polishing it again, then so be it. But it's just a matter of actually, you know, puking it out, um, actually getting it out there in the world and out from inside of you. And then once it's out, you can, you know, evaluate it, really, really look at the pukiness of it and uh, clean it up as, as you see fit. But again, thank you so much to Ken for coming on the show and uh, for giving us that push. Definitely check out his TED Talk. It will be linked in the show notes page at yourcreativepush.com slash Dr. Kent. D-R-K-E-N-T or yourcreativepush.com slash 38. On tomorrow's show, we have Martin Aveling. It's hard to schedule creativity, but sometimes you do need to make that little bit of extra effort to kind of coax it out. Um, and a friend of mine whose grandmother was a, a, a well-known children's author, she had a great saying, which was, don't get it right, get it written. And I was trying to think what the uh, equivalent uh, in art would be, and the best I came up with was, don't get it drawn, get it doodled. Principle is the same, basically. You just have to do it and not be held back by, by fear, uh, fear of making mistakes, because all those things are good. And coming back to what I was saying before, you, it's, it's a win-win situation, you know? You, even if you produce something that you feel isn't fantastic, you're going to learn from that. You're going to grow from that. So what have you got to lose? Just get down and do it. Martin's a really talented artist and really great guy. I really enjoyed uh, my conversation with him. Uh, he draws animals really, really detailed. And um, as I even say in the interview that when I first found him, I thought that he was an animal photographer. And then I realized you know, how just detailed and lifelike his, his work is. He's a really great guy as well, and I really, really enjoyed our conversation. So that is tomorrow for you if you need that push, but hopefully today you were inspired enough to go puke, you know, go get that work done, and we will be here for you tomorrow if you need the push again. So thank you so much for listening and subscribing. Have a productive day, and I will see you tomorrow. Have a great day.